Welcome to another episode of the Edgy Futurist podcast. Um, can't say what day. We're no longer allowed to say what time of day when we are recording. It is like we are the CIA um, or FBI. We're all in secret, all hidden, and everything else. The movement has gone behind doors and closed doors, everybody. Um, but this one is one that I am mega excited about. Uh, I don't know if anybody can see Nick, but she's she's really excited. You know, she's pulling faces. She's ready for it. Uh, we've been. This person has been a champion of ours behind the scenes for a long period of time, and we've loved the fact that this year, Nick was, and her, the work that she's been doing was shortlisted, highly commended, and was a winner in her in her sector in her field. So, uh, without further ado, let's bring Nick in. And do you want to do a bit of an introduction to yourself? I think I don't want to butcher it, Nick. So, do you want to do you want to go there? Goodness me. Uh, I'm Nick. I'm uh, Nick Ponsford. I'm the founder and CEO of the GEC, the Global Quality Collective, and also I'm a doctorate researcher as well. And I suppose I earned my stripes. I started teaching in 2000 and I've been rolling around in education since then. So will you tell us a little bit about GEC then? Because obviously you started that as a... Um... Uh, and and there's there's obviously a motivation that comes f- from a personal motivation, but also um, a more societal and global uh, motivation. Tell us a little bit about GC and what and what it is that you're working on. Okay, I'll try. I'll try and do a short version, and then you can always pull out more because uh, I've had a quite a, an origins tale to get to here. Um, so the GC, as it stands today, is, is basically two things. So. We are the people, so we are a collective of um, inclusion, diversity and well-being experts. In fact, we're the largest um, directory. We've got over 400 people and organisations. Um, and they cover not just the Equality Act, but everything to do with what's called hyperdiversity. So that's your demographic identities, your cognitive and neurodiversity, cultural capital, which brings in socioeconomic status, and also biodiversity. And then the second the second part of the GEC is a GEC platform, which we've co-designed with universities, with the, um, the collective, and that's been part of the doctoral work, which I, I'm, I'm, I'm rushing into. Um, and so the GEC platform, we launched a couple of years ago, and it's gone brilliantly. So it's an ed tech solution to look at equity in schools and give schools all the things that they need based on my history, which I can tell you about. Um, and to date, we have um uh, impacted on over i think it's about 220,000 students we're in about over 300 schools in 30 countries and the survey which is part of a platform we've now surveyed 22,000 students staff and teachers on everything about what it is about being in a school going to school and being part of a school um and at the moment i'm looking at the data which is massive. So I'm looking at how AI can support me with ethical data collection as well. So there's a few bits there for you to get your teeth into. (laughs) It's fascinating. Um, I think we discussed with a lot of people um, around different... I've left my window open. So if anybody has any background noise, apologies. Somebody will start cutting the lawn in a minute knowing. So I'll shut it at some point when when it's appropriate. But... um, it, we've had lots of conversations over the years in regards to people that have uh, talked about conversations they've had, the collection mm-hmm. and the insights that they've been given. But ultimately, I think um it goes back to probably one of the first bits of work I was doing when I was in colleges mm-hmm. and the, the Feltag agenda. And the Feltag agenda, I don't know if you're familiar with it, Nick, um, mm-hmm. from Bob Harrison around uh, the, the, the further education learning technologies group and, and the implementation. And the, and one of those key bits that mm. Bob and so many people after Bob have gone back to, and one thing that you're talking about is engaging and having conversations and getting that accurate data to build mm. accurate steps forward from all stakeholders, not just yeah. one of saying, oh, well, we think leaders think this, or we think mm-hmm. the, the tech providers think this. Actually, what, what students, and I think it was uh, last week, um, or recently, me and Ben discussed having more students back onto the podcast in controlled environments mm. because we've done that before. We've, actually, if we're talking about the future of, of learning, mm. not a controlled environment where the teachers are telling the, the students what answers they should give, because ultimately we might as well speak to the teachers, but how can we get mm. actual insights from all of the stakeholders that are, um, that are passionate about the future of education? So yeah. maybe talk about how, obviously, AI will play a part, but yeah. how, what does that look like to 
Because that's a big piece of, of data oh, yeah. collection and research. What what does that look like? Yeah, so basically, so I I started teaching in 2000, which was a year the Google browser kind of came in. And I had done a little bit of work in kind of marketing and advertising before I did my PGCE and then became a teacher in a secondary school. And I'd asked, you know, do you, do you look at, um, do you do like media? And then ended up running a media department. So when I started teaching, I was an NQT and I was a head of department at the same time. Um, then like the iPhone and everything came in. So I was, I was like the one shoved out in front of people, basically like in my school and then like regionally and then nationally. And so all the work I've always done, I've always kind of looked to get help basically, because I've always been sort of winging it a bit. So I always knew the value of trying to find that expertise elsewhere and then having to understand knowledge to then give to other people. Um, so that, you know, as a, as a teacher and doing A-levels and BTECs and GCSEs. And then when I became an advanced skills teacher, uh, my job was basically going and doing like firefighting in schools, essentially. Um, not like the nice early years variety where you go in and they tell you about, you know, their career. It was like going in this this school has got X problem. What can we do about it? And so when I became an AST, I started then not just looking at kind of my subjects and kind of like my schools. I started to work across the board and have a bit more of an aerial view of education. And as an advanced skills teacher, you know, I didn't want to be a head teacher at that point, but I moved like up the the different verticals and and horizontal hierarchies of schools. So I had to know how to talk to different groups in front of me, albeit middle leaders or exec teams or parents or different students or, you know, like um, um, early years providers, etc. So my, I suppose my time in schools as well as having one foot in a classroom was then spent talking to all these different groups and because um people tend to overshare when they talk to me it's a gift which my husband I don't think likes uh people always tell me stuff um what tended to happen as I started to find out what was going on to work out the solution I would find out that people would talk to me and they wouldn't actually talk to the people that were making those decisions So I had to come out of education, which is another story out of a classroom. And I worked for an educational charity after I had the kids. And that was a coaching model about whole organisational change. And that was a coaching model, very traditional, like going in, doing an audit, doing workshops and then kind of measuring like the outcomes at the end. Not digital, though. And this was I did this from like 2010 until about 2019 very successful nationally based around send pupils and and, and disadvantage in the main. But again, I would go and do focus groups and I would do interviews and people would say after I couldn't say that because my line manager was in there or I'm not going to say that because I hate that teacher. So I was like, actually, the way we collect data and we collect that voice in education isn't reliable because people don't really tell us how they feel. And yet this data is what we create a whole ecosystem on and I knew for me like you know when I fell pregnant when I'd had other issues that actually school wasn't a safe place I couldn't tell people how I felt and I know that's the case for lots of I knew it for students because school's my safe place when I was little but actually I realized a lot of staff don't feel safe and now I'm a parent parent three kids one send it's not safe in that so what I wanted to do I think was look at Okay, well, if we want to really understand how a school works and we want it to work for the people in it, we need to know what they think so we can work out what we can do that meets their underserved needs. So when I that was a whole point, I kind of set up the GC because I was looking at the same time for for the doctorate. Like I did a literature review and I was looking at, well, how do we collect this data in education? So I looked at the data in education. And the data in education is essentially what the government wants to get and then what schools produce. So you've got this kind of like feedback loop with no new data coming in. We also, as well, when we look at data in schools, we tend to look at this. There's different types. So you get your mapping data, which is like your big attendance stuff, which can go across nationally. Then you get your satellite data, which is like the reading results, you know, or, you know, your English results or maths or whatever. but what we don't tend to do in schools is, is all the bit that when you do these focus groups, like the reasons that people 
don't go to their English lessons or the reasons why kids aren't attending or, you know, they're refusing to come to school or why that member of staff is kind of quietly quitting or, you know, all those things. So in terms of your recruitment, your retention and your attendance in particular, we don't get reliable data. And so that's what I wanted to do with the GEC. And the way that I've collected the voice from his different stakeholders, first of all, I went out on a kind of quest of like, what do I need to know? Like, I've got my lived experience, but I don't have your lived experience. So I went out and I found all the, not just one person with lived experience, I found all the groups. So, you know, I, you know, like BAMED, LGBT plus ed, authors, academics, and through all the different parts of education. So, and that's, that's like online and offline, because they've both been really important to my work. So I found out who was doing what and what that looked like. And then I looked at the research behind it and looked why we aren't getting enough girls in STEM, why boys in literacy, why black boys are treated like they're a lot older than they actually are, why neurodivergency is understood. And I looked at it from a lived experience point of view. And then I looked at the data collection and I realised we're missing this kind of third strand of, of data collection in schools, which is, you know, that reason, that lived experience. And because no one had created a way because intersectional data just makes you go like that. No one had designed it. And so that's what I went out and did. And the scary thing, like with our data, well, I'm not, I am now a data scientist, but I feel like I'm still a media teacher, um, is that like we've got 1.2 million rows of data because our data is so personalised with all the intersectional information that we've got so I'm now really pleased that I didn't spend loads of money on tech because AI's come in at right just at the right point for me thanks very much so I can now use AI to understand what our data is how we interrogate it um but I suppose the bit that I'm missing in this is that what I then did when I wanted to create the service I worked with universities I worked with four universities and looked at things like the modern sexism scale anti-racist monitors with the questions I looked at how we do surveys in schools which are basically quizzes because we write quizzes we think we can write surveys in school we can't uh, so I worked with clinical psychologists and then I worked with school leaders etc so for the student one we've just done we worked for a year, we worked with 50 schools, 50 student councils for a year on what's a survey, how are you given surveys, what happens when you do it, what would you want from a survey? And we designed it with the kids themselves to work out what we should design. So we do that at each stage. So I did it for the staff, done it for the students. And in 24, 25, I'm looking at working out how we capture parent and carer voice is like that third evolution. I don't think it's a surveys. Parents don't traditionally engage with surveys very well so I want to look at what tech we can use and find out like what we can help them when it comes to like intentional inclusion in schools so that participatory research of that kind of co-designing piece has been really important to me in like the content and also like the design of the tech as well but yeah it's taken bit it'd be really easy to bang out a quiz and just give it but what I wanted to do was like take the time and really understand it and I think that's why people have really engaged with what we're trying to do at the GC. Yeah, and I think that level of... I used to teach sociology, right? So I was a religious studies philosophy teacher mainly, but then I, I got to teach some sociology. So um, I'm appreciating the conversation about inter intersectionality of data. I'm appreciating the idea of that we need quantitative elements. So yes, we can do the numbers say this, and then the qualitative element, the experiences, the discussions the interviews tell us this which is a really powerful thing because what tends to happen in education you don't need me to tell you this but uh, as as we talk about this regularly what tends to happen in, in we, we focus very heavily on the quantitative numbers that mm -hmm. say this percentage of students are now um uh school avoiders or school refusers uh, and then this percentage of students from this demographic are mm -hmm. achieving or Here's the average, here's the norm. And that's all That's all well and good to some extent. But if it doesn't have a story behind it, and I think that's what I'm, I'm picking up from what you're saying, if it doesn't have the story behind it, the, we, we just pe treat people like numbers. And nobody, people aren't a number, right? They're, they are more than that, that in individual demographic and that statistic. That's it, that's it. And like today, so I haven't got the kids today, so I've been doing a bit of work and I've been looking at um, what social what social capital is. So I think in education, we now know what a cultural capital is. But the social capital is that kind of connectedness and those relationships. And I think post-COVID, we're understanding if we want bums in seats in physical site schools, 
what we have to do because the kids have sort of voted what they want and and what's going on and what they're actually interested in and how we kind of negate that and you can't look at kind of diverse um, EDI without the lived experience um, and, and and Ben you're absolutely right and what we tend to do I think with that data as you said that's almost like the, the deficit model of of collecting data because it's like why are they not attending rather than why would they attend? And that's what I'm trying to look at, that gap of. And, and what also happens, because we're talking about small, underserved minority groups, when you look at the data, what I also wanted to do was kind of flip that round. So actually, the underserved groups are the headline data. So it might only be five, you know, like seven people, for example. But that is what's put to the top of your data, because actually our data historically is not serving those people that we're losing, you know, we're losing the numbers of stuck teachers that we already know. We're not recruiting diversity for our, our staff bodies, our governing bodies, our executives, the decision makers and trusts. And then we're having issues with a kind of a, a, a class and a range of intersectional biases when it comes to our new catchment areas where we've got more refugee migrant children um, boys that are you know on tiktok listening to tate and all that kind of stuff and that misogyny that's kind of getting into the classrooms so all of those barriers that we're creating we're not really identifying how we can make things better because we're still looking at that the very old traditional models of data that that we've always kind of got but against this real awareness of what a culture is you know what what we should be doing when we're connecting with each other and so I've, I've been trying to look at that middle ground of what it could be and and I did like I did go to the DfE back in the day and kind of said about all these these things they weren't that interested and I find it really interesting looking at what some of the MIS systems are trying to capture because they kind of do the same thing so um, that's kind of why I've done it on my lonesome, but I brought my um, renter party group of the collective with me to help me with it um, to kind of understand because I just felt we're still not really understanding our schools with all this tech and all this power, but it wasn't being funneled in the right way, I felt. Um, but, you know, so that's that's kind of where I'm yeah. at with it at the moment. All in, all in my opinion, of course, like everything does, is, is my opinion is that. Um, the DfE probably don't engage because they probably have to realise that there's lots of reasons of how they could make it potentially better, mm-hmm. uh, rather than these are the people, these are the million that don't sit exams, these are the six percent that don't do this, these seven percent, these are the and mm-hmm. kind of look at it as a as a negative um, thing that they release and talk about of well everybody's doing well but these people aren't and this is the reason why. Where ultimately I think to once you've got that information to make a change the change potentially is brought to the forefront of what you've got to do so yeah. as a, I, 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 I think if you look at those whatever reason being but mm. I, don't, I don't know the percentages and i'm sure you've got loads of data to hand I'm not asking asking for from to pull them off the top of your head as well but yeah. if you say actually you know, in terms of those um let's let's classify them as a repeat not non-attenders mm. I've, I've been a chair and that's probably the, the statistic and the line that they'd say these are the regular non-attenders mm. and what does this look like and what we're we doing to support mm. them how are we always just reporting it um once you kind of break that down in terms of different demographic or different uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the different people that sit within that collective group mm. per school per trust nationally you then ha- have a conversation as i'm sure you're doing to then say mm. okay well how could we help get make learning different so you Mm. can engage the alternative to what's there is if you don't attend school your your parents go to to court or you Mm. go to an alternative provision potentially if you're if you're lucky or you get to do woodwork or some other vocational you know the Mm. btex of the world in in a college setting because Mm. school's not for you rather than actually changing the community to be more welcoming and more open to so much more diversity and of thinking, of thought, of yeah. of everything. That there's one million children don't get to that point of of, of GCSE every year, and it just mm. doesn't get tackled because we don't want to create a different solution for them. We just say, well, you go into colleges, or you go yeah. some, and do something else, or you just get fined for it. 
But there are different ways coming in. So we've started to see, and I think, like, being fair, we are the first generation experience technology and the impact on society and education um, and, and, and what it means to learn and what a job is, which is different. So we've we've kind of been through the first hundred years of formal education. And I like to think we're going towards the next kind of hundred years. And we're already starting to see that decentralisation of schools where, you know, we have got home learning happening. You know, the numbers for September were the largest they've ever seen a migration for of, of more parents looking to do home learning because they're now working from home or actually returning after COVID hasn't suited their children and they want a different way. We're seeing more virtual schools, particularly supporting neurodivergent students, where actually going back to classes of 30, which are kind of difficult and there's a lack of understanding from the teachers of how they can feel a sense of belonging. Actually, they'd rather work from home and, and they will do better in wherever they're going. We're seeing portfolio careers and the use of technology and entrepreneurial skills like we've never seen before. So I think with the new government that's come in, we're starting to have to see like if we're talking about physical schools or a choice of education, which is led by some parents, we are starting to kind of see that change. And then the other thing I'd say, so with the GC platform, we didn't just divide, design in a survey because what happens, you do a survey and then it's like, oh, great, kind of told us what we already know. What next? And no one knows what to do next. So what we did then, that's the first step. The next step is you kind of you get your data. We've got coaching recommendations by the collective because we want to know what to do next. So we've got it from the experts. They use that to create an action plan. And then we've got a whole resource hub, which has got loads of videos and interviews and podcasts. And we call them playbooks on how to, to make the change. And what I did when I designed the platform and we released it is I looked at it in a, a school's context because when we when we talk about education, we tend to then start, as you did then, Steve, start talking about, you know, what we do nationally and it's massive and there's millions. But actually, when you work in a school, you're working with the kids in front of you and school leaders want to know how to support the kids in front of them. So the way the platform was originally designed was that it was trust or, you know, network or individual school or college led. So they could say, well, this is this is a landscape for our kids and, and staff we've got in front of us. This is what they're saying to us now. Here are the things that we can do. And then do you know what? We'll ask them again in a year and we'll kind of see how that's changed, see where we've got wins, see where we need to do it. What I didn't realise is we get hundreds of schools on so quickly. So I'm now at a point where I can look at that kind of international data and actually pull that out. But my idea was always it was about contests because that's what schools are. They are their context. They are the staff they've got in that staff room or you know, virtually or whatever. They are the kids that are coming in and out on off that site. That's kind of your focus, isn't it, when you're a teacher? You don't really we can get all this national data and it's great for showing us like where we sit in that kind of competitive bit. But there's a bit of me in terms of like the EDI stuff, that that competitiveness, that that, you know, um league table creates tokenistic behaviours which if in any area you don't want it in EDI. <laughs> We don't want just people putting posters up and getting badges when actually the lived experience is horrendous. So that that's where I kind of go between the both of like looking at school in its context and look at the people they serve and what next, which is why we kind of got a different approach. Um, but also where I'm now starting to see what well, I can start to pull out national data. But I don't know how important that is. I don't know how important it is to tell everyone, well, this demographic of people are having a really bad time. Because we all probably know it. I mean, we can we can do it for the people that don't know. But um, I don't know. What do you think? I think I think the I think the numbers like to comparison. Interestingly, we we spoke a few weeks ago with uh, Ian Phillips, and mm. um, he was talking about how in a lot of times schools are seen as competitors, mm. when actually they should be more like comparators. So, and, and I really liked that as a phrase um, because what tends to happen is that that data becomes a weapon uh just like the i've i've said this before and i'm not i'm not slagging off certain schools or colleges that do this because i was part of the number one college in the country mm -hmm. like and that number one college in the country according to the uk performance tables had the world's biggest sign on their outside of their college saying number one uh and then the college down the road 
which was his big competitor, had um, outside of its thing the biggest poster that said the only outstanding college in Lancashire. So, like, th- that whole numbers thing, and I'm not saying they have done this, but can be weaponized. And so that comp- that competitor league table, this demographic here is underachieving compared to this one there, or it's... Like I remember Accrington, where I'm from, uh, the the, the it, it blows my mind. There's a ward in Accrington, and he wore it like a badge of honour that it had the highest teenage pregnancy rate in Europe. Like, like not that that, that and it was almost like we're more poor than you are. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. was that was what yeah. he wanted to say. It wasn't. It wasn't that. Um, it was. It was just a badge of honour. And mm. so that's that's. I suppose the the difficulty because if we're talk- the irony of all of this mm. is that we're talking about equality and, and diversity and yeah. inclusion. And actually, what we tend to do is point at the things that are different in people, yeah. uh, and then do a competition. It's just yeah, it, and it, that's and what I we think- want. But I think there's a bit like this is what we're this is what we're used to doing. So if we take from a data point of view, I I went to an international conference and that you know it was about data and well being. So it was really cool because you know it was kind of a different way to look at it. And what was really interesting is you know when you ask a group of like teachers like what's the most important kind of data? Is it well being? Is it student fight? They go oh well being. Yeah, well being is the most important. It's like great. Everyone said the right thing. Well done, everyone. And then you'll say, so um, what kind of five different bits of data do you collect? And everyone starts to look a bit stumped about like what that mean, means. And then you ask, like, what training have you had to look at data? And again, everyone kind of like looks back at you and, uh, well, you know, some deputy head has stood up and went through an Excel spreadsheet at some point. And so that's my training kind of thing. And then you're like, well, what's the data maturity model at your organisation? How do you, as an organisation, all treat data? Like, where where do you go in your year one? How does that look for you? No one has a clue. Like, I do it my way. Someone next door to me does it a completely different way. We kind of club it together for a department kind of thing. And when you then ask, well, OK, well, what do you use that measures well-being or what do you do that, you know, illustrates how happy you are or this or that? We kind of look at the traditional ways that we look at data. We don't look at it in a different way. So even by saying, I don't know if we should do national you know, collection data on well-being, I don't know if it really makes any, you know, it makes a nice report, but actually does it impact on the kids in my school, for example, it's just a different way of looking at it. And I think that's where I've got to with it is kind of starting to question like, why are we doing this? Are we doing this for that comparative piece? Because that might get more people into your school, more staff, retain your staff, attract more families to put their kids in there so you're oversubscribed. That's kind of what, you know, schools want. Or is it because, you know, what is it? So what is it you are trying to achieve? And you will find a measure or you'll find something to get that outcome. But I think with looking at this through a kind of ethical lens, like the ethical lens at looking at AI, where it grabs all the data, it fills in the gaps and you don't want to fill in the gap when it comes to EDI data. That's wrong. <laughs> Just in case anyone thinks. So you don't want to make stuff up with a, with, with that kind of ethical data of people's lived experience. So therefore that's unreliable and it doesn't work at the moment. So you have to kind of like chuck some stuff out to kind of work out what you can kind of keep in as well. And I think that kind of questioning around that EDI is made a lot harder when you throw what is ethical into it because it's much easier to do it in the way we've always done it. Yeah, and I think, yeah, lots to unpick there. I was sitting listening, I'm thinking, and I, I, I'm constantly thinking, right, I'll ask a question based on this and I'll ask a question based on this. And then when it gets to the point of asking a question, everybody that's listened to the podcast says, Stephen never really asked a question. He just talks for five minutes and then goes, I'm not really sure what I'm going to get to. So I'm going to try and, just go back and unpick that bit, but worry, I think I it's right. I think you as well, so it's fine. I think that the looking nationally shows the big picture, mm. but ultimately, I think we had um, somebody recently on the podcast that talked about um, that what we've had previously in a very different context is um, creating something that is very simple mm. and then creates a shackle of the current system that we've got. What we're trying to achieve through all of the wonderful things in terms of the future of education, obviously mm-hmm. um, equity and equality and, and, uh, and all of the, the EDI and everything else that comes into it is we're trying to create unique individual organizations mm-hmm. 
that are very bespoke and specific to the context of where they sit. So you might be able to take some ideas, but everything has to be then applied to the context of where the environment it sits in, the, the diversity of the organization, the demographic, the, the teaching, the staff, the people that go to those schools and everything else. Because what you don't want to create is get all of this data and go, well, well look, we, we, we could improve massively in this way, mm. then scale up to national. But ultimately, people then go, well, that doesn't really apply to us. Because what we want to create is a million or a thousand unique, wonderful mm. organizations that exist on the thought of what outstanding actually is. Mm not what we define it in a really na narrow pigeonhole of, Yeah, that then is completely, like, you know, you've said you've worked in education, Ben has and I have. We've probably all coached, mm -hmm. well, we have, we've all coached, we've all mentored, we've gone into mm -hmm. classes and everything else. If somebody had to then say, could you write a list of everything that makes a, a, a lesson outstanding? I'd go, absolutely not, but I knew it when I, when I walked in, I felt it and I yeah. could feel it. And that's what we want for every individual organisation. And mm -hmm. scaling up nationally is a challenge because what we want is to create this wonderful, and I always go back to it, uh, the way that I picture it is a wonderful rainforest of just outstanding practice happening that just shoots from the, and I think creating too much rigidity based on data or anything that we're trying to do would shackle what you intended to set out to improve and benefit in the long term anyway. I think we just have to provide the data, make mm -hmm. it applicable, let them take it and support them applying it to each individual context mm. and maybe through your ability to coach because that's where you've been previously. You mm. coach individuals and it's going to be tiresome, tenacious work to work every single multi-academy school. I'm sure you're up for it. Mm. Uh, having met you, uh, your, your energy is going to pass <laughs> through. But I think it's going to, that's much more harder than saying, right, national, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. I think the reason why people don't pick it off like the, uh, the you know, the, whole elephant and eat a leg at a time rather than mm. eat the whole elephant is because it's harder to take those steps because it takes so much longer and so much more hard work mm. to do so so but, but maybe that's where we have to start we have to treat every individual school even if they're in a multi-academy trust yeah you then don't create a a policy or a, a focus for the whole multi-academy trust because each individual school within it is very different within itself yeah hopefully it is. i've explained and, and, that well but that's probably what i've just taken from that yeah, and uh, and it is there's a difference between a kind of so where where we've got the platform, we've got an individual approach, and then we've got like a trust or you know local authority kind of approach. But the idea is that with like a network of schools, say there is someone that is their GC champion, normally SLT, that comes in, they do um, the self assessment of where they think that organisation is. Now. I know when I used to go and do whole organisational improvement with schools, you'd go in, you speak to someone in the SLT and they say, oh, our school's like this. And then you just go around and you ask a few people and they go, no, it's not like that at all. So we have the organisational one and then they get a nice badge because people like a badge, don't they? Get a nice digital badge. And then we do the staff and that's all staff. So that's lunchtime supervisors, governors, uh, TAs, like the whole lot. Because again, I the work that I did like they are all part of a the school they're all the cogs the important people and and the amount of times I would work with a kid who was having a hard time and therefore giving everyone a hard time and one some you know something said by someone in the office because they came in late or someone on the, the site team who was someone's uncle who knew them and there'd be a brick through a window and I'd have to go back and do all the work so it, you know you need that ecosystem even with an individual school to kind of do it and then you get that staff voice. And it, and also we do it anonymously for staff voice. So people aren't scared of what they can say. And we've we our feedback generally is from the people that do the surveys, I've never been asked questions about this this part of my life before. And from the school leaders we get, we didn't know we didn't know this. So there's that kind of understanding for a school that that 360, if you don't have that lived experience, you don't tend to ask about it or, or know the right language or know where to ask that person in an appropriate way. So we kind of do that and that kind of helps. Um, and then obviously we've got the student one as well. Um, and I think what was interesting right at the start of it was this idea that there is no doubt data out there. Let's make some up. Like let's have a go at what what's kind of missing. And that's been really interesting looking at, 
different kind of well-being indexes, looking at like different scales that are out there that are used in higher ed or FE or in early, like in different ways in education and kind of pulling all of that together. Um, and also I think that it's like organic, like the way we're doing things at the moment, we keep changing, we keep learning. And again, there's like either the tech way or an understanding around sort of social sciences and what it means to like be a person, be part of a culture in education. I mean, well-being for staff wasn't something that's ever really been that prioritised in the past. Like you've got a donut day on a Friday and you tell everyone you think you're the best school in the world. Like, whereas now, you know, I know one of our trusts, for example, they've looked at how they can just take deliveries for their staff because actually on a Saturday, everyone was running around trying to open lockers to get all their stuff. And actually it was great if you just got all your delivery sent to the school, it's one less thing to do at the weekend. And I think we're starting to see our relationship with schools change as as people that work in them. But we're also, you know, meeting a lot of challenges, which only technology can help. Because if you start to think about all those different groups that we mentioned earlier, like, you know, your eyes start bleeding and your brain falls out of your ears because it's, you know, intersectionality stuff's really hard. But the tech can kind of help you understand it um, and then work out like where you're at with it and where you can go forward. So I think like doing any kind of audit or like where are we at now is good, but you it needs to be, as I said, kind of really well done. Um, we work with four universities in creating ours as well as stakeholders because, it you know, it's hard to find out how people feel in education, it turns out. We all talk about it, but actually when you, you know, get under the hood, it's quite tricky to understand how people feel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> It is because it's because people's stories, right? And they've got a perspective, and they've got paradigms and lenses that they look through, and um, everybody's got a story, and that that really matters. And 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 to be fair, that's probably if we if we to bring this to the whole conversation um, that we've been, that we've been talking about a lot is that when you create a one size fits all curriculum and a one size fits all schooling system and a one size fits all data collection and uh, surveying it, like it just doesn't work because we know that one size fits all doesn't actually fit anybody mm. and so uh, i really like what, what what's happening here interesting just to uh just just to take it on a little bit of a tangent as well if we can just thinking about like the people that are going to be listening to this are going to be either leaders in education, they may well be uh, technology teachers in that space, or even they could be tech companies that are sat in this space that are working in the education sector. Um, I, I'm really like keen as somebody who is doing the level of research that you're doing, that's gathering the kind of data that you're doing, that has got the lived experience that you have, that might be worth just kind of sharing in that space, as well as um, the ex lived experience of the people that you've worked with as part of the collective. What what do we need to do differently uh, in education that, that that you're seeing? Because I think your voice into that is absolutely um, you've you've got kudos to be able to, to for people to listen to it. Yikes! Now I'm scared. Um, what can people do? Well, I I think realize that you will never be the expert in this. Um, we've got someone in our collective, and he says how schools are the paramedics and not the surgeons. And I think once you realise that you don't know everything and you're not going to know everything and get comfortable with that, actually, you become more confident that you're going to like listen and understand and kind of lean into the people in your organisation. Um, so I, what would I suggest? Uh, I would diversify who you listen to um and, and what you do so on our social media we we bring our collective and we amplify the work that they're doing as well which helps people understand so most recently with um the riots we've brought in as many of the collective of the resources to help schools and help people out there that's all there for free um i would say that obviously you know get in contact with us see how we can help you we help um organizations so we help um and partner with lots of organisations to help them with this. We did some work recently with the Royal Opera House, which was <laughs> just some kind of, I never thought I'd do that. Um, but we, you know, we work um, alongside schools, trusts, colleges as well, um, individual or, you know, as organisations as well. And I think really, I suppose it's taking time to reflect on <clears throat> how you really listen to the people in your organisation um, and what you think listening is, how you feel that they might have a voice or not have a voice. Um, 
because if you're worried about recruitment or retention or attendance or safety or well-being that you have to um it, we are going to lose more staff and more students from our physical sites in education unless we start to change how we look at being connected um and there's two kind of things that come out of um, social capital. So one is that bonding. So that's the people who've got the same sort of similar experiences to you and you kind of find that affinity. But there's that bridging as well. And it's a bridging with people that have a different lived experience and how you can support them. So how can you support uh, people around flexible working, for example, in your schools from a staff point of view? How can you look at, you know, where where the physical parts of your school are safe for your students to be. They might feel safe in their classroom, but not the corridors. Um, how do your students see themselves in the curriculum? Have they not been at school just because of who they are? This is all the stuff we kind of collect. And and like, what are you going to do about that? How are you going to continue to listen to them and and mould the environment um, around them? There's a like some sort of gif or something or memo infographic i've seen which is like you know the soil around the plant and it's that it's like how can we really help that environment and that ecosystem so those those would be my first um uh food for thought uh suggestions the takeaways sweet like that cool well we at this point in uh things steve's still we're finding that button i i did it last time didn't i mate? i was really struggling <laughs> The, the challenge for me is I breathe really, really heavy. So you either listen to anybody that's listening, you either l- listen to Ben breathing because Ben doesn't, Ben doesn't mute. I do I sometimes. Mute. No, so you either so all of the heavy breathing over the last few episodes will have been Ben because I'm always on mute. Lies. But when I got, so, I've taken screenshots just to prove it, Nick. Okay. Joe, it just, it just we just argue on the podcast. Or, no, so but I, what I do is and I click it for some reason. I don't know whether it's the the trackpad or whether it's just literally my old decrepit fingers or what but every time i have to click it three times for it to mute uh, nobody can see it i'm gonna have to record every time i do it just to prove it maybe i shouldn't but um yeah it's a it's a really interesting thing i think we've discussed you know in the era of technology and mm. these online schools and everything that pops up how can we use technology to enable and improve things and change things and transform it but still maintain those connections and collaborations i've discussed i think we've done it on the podcast where we talk about schools that have been redesigned and new schools Mm. are built with in mind as many preformed average classrooms as you can get where they host a certain number they have the certain chairs Mm. in there but actually what that has impacted in terms of fe from what i've seen in terms of my experience and also Mm -hmm. from from what, what conversations i'm still having with friends is where are your classroom? Uh, your, your sorry, your, your your breakout spaces are beyond that. Where your know, connections and and all of those thought processes outside of just learning mm-hmm. can take place. Those real learning and connecting bits um, um, for staff and students. Those those connecting spaces. Where's mm-hmm. the staff rooms that aren't just offices where you have to sit and eat at your desk or go to the canteen uh, with the, the kids. That's fine. They'll respect it. But at the same point, you know, having those honest conversations. Mm-hmm. And I think we also have to get back to, and, I, and, and in the work I do, I celebrate um, positive, what I class as positive conflict, bringing radical candor yeah. into conversations where people are honestly saying, because the last thing I want to do is to bring into any organization as a person that's leading it to then say, or, or a small team, so you might be a, a person that says, well, I don't lead. You do, you lead mm-hmm. a, a, as a teacher. That you bring people in exactly the same as you. That's not what we want. I know mm-hmm. me and Ben are two white lads on a podcast from the north of England. That's because we're friends, and that's why we're trying to bring diverse thought and rebel ideas to the podcast. Mm -hmm. Because what I always champion is diverse thought, diverse thinking, and diverse Mm -hmm. opinion. That ultimately, what we need to understand and celebrate is that in terms of really opening up and becoming a community in our schools and and, and across networks of organisations is that different thoughts and opinions are absolutely fine. It's okay to have a different opinion. It's okay to have a different viewpoint and to not agree on things. Mm. That's what life is. That's the benefit. And I think what we're trying to do is at times we're not allowing that because we see conversations where people don't agree as a negative. And I'm like, yeah, actually, that's fine. That cre- that breeds real conversation and positivity through that mm. positive conflict of, of conversation, negotiation, going, 
I, I respect what you're saying, but ultimately I disagree with what you're saying. That, and that's fine as two, too. Mm-hmm. But I think we're just in a bit of a space at the minute where that just doesn't seem to be happening and, and the spaces are just not there for, for people to do it face to face. Yeah, and I think like you, so we offer training, um, like when we started to look at this, we realised that you have to know how to hold and receive those conversations as well. And that can be quite tricky. So either being someone who feels really uncomfortable when they are uncomfortable, but you need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, or it could be that you've never been able to have a voice about these things before. So where on earth do you start and, and why are you voicing the experience for a whole protected characteristic when that might lose your job or people may not like you and da da da. So there's there's an element of working out those conversations. And I've always in my head had this kind of idea that I always thought schools were a bit and colleges were a bit of a mad place. Like everyone gets up on a Monday and they all go to the same build, like hundreds of people all go to the same building and then they all go away at a certain time and then they all come back again. And it was used to really annoy me with sometimes with leadership decisions where you'd be waiting and you'd be like, yeah, but we're all going to come back. We're all, we're all going to be, you know, around each other again tomorrow. Like we need a decision now and schools aren't like that. So it's accepting that we're all on site. We're all kind of together. So what are we going to do about it to to maximise that how we learn? I mean, there's been parts of, you know, some areas about knowledge and how we, you know, pour knowledge into into kids. But we know kids aren't just vessels. Kids are social. Kids need connection. Kids need to feel safe. So you can't have one without the other. And it's throw in, I suppose, the worth, and that's where I suppose data comes in because schools are data, um, but and that action around it, but how we do that. The spaces thing, I think, is quite interesting. So I worked in one of the first building schools for future schools um, back in 2005. That's where I became an AST. And um, they kind of built the school, and I was lucky enough that I'd take a hard hat and I'd go from one site to the other and help build it, which was really cool. And I worked with several schools after it. And where we've seen loads of schools be, you know, really open plan, a lot of people are now saying to the architects, we don't want open plan anymore. It's an absolute acoustic nightmare. Like it doesn't work for us. But there's some really creative ways when you look at schools globally and particularly the independent schools um, and international schools because they've got more money and they, you know, the kids have a priority because they need kids to be happy because the parents are paying. So you've got like a really different kind of system to what we have in state schools. But there are some really interesting ways that we can use those physical um, spaces um, that are flexible. But I think there's always going to be a need for kind of private conversations for where people feel that, you know, that they're safe. And I I keep going back to that word safe, because I think that's what a lot of our schools are lacking at the moment um, for a mixture of reasons. Yeah. To, to, totally agree. Totally agree. And we talk about psychological safety and we talk about all the other types of elements in there as well. It's been a theme from what from what's come out, as you, as you well know, as well. Well, we always finish off our podcast episodes with three quick questions, um, as you, you're probably well aware. So uh, I'm, I'm going to start off and then Steve will do one and I'll do another one. So just quick fire. Okay. So but what comes to the top of your mind there? So if you could change one thing about education overnight, what would it be? Everyone felt safe. There you go. <laughs> cool. Yeah. The second one? Did Steve need more time? <laughs> I do that too quick. That's I'm the quickest to, fire, quick trying. fire question ever, isn't it? I, I wasn't, I wasn't prepared for the fact that somebody actually answered, somebody actually answered it quick fire. <laughs> I was like, I'm waiting for the next two minutes. Okay, what's your mo- what's the most exciting educational trends that you're seeing emerging? Ooh, that's a hard one. Um, what's the most exciting educational trend? Um, I don't know if it's a trend, but I've um, oh, it may be. Two, can I have a a part A and a part B? So I'm going to say yes before you say no. So um, I think looking at esports in education is really exciting. Uh, Again, seeing that with international independent schools, but I think there is an awful lot to be said about particularly kids that aren't sporty in a traditional sense. And we want to get engaged with a load of skills that come out of being part of a team that kind of thing so I really like that and that kind of um, excitement around using technology which is maybe more student-led so that's probably the first thing and the second thing 
Um, I'm really excited um, about how some teachers are using AI and actually like throwing in loads of mistakes and the kids finding it out. So I've always seen technology as a bit of a sandpit for my kids um, and like them to think about how that they would do that in the industry. That was always sort of the thing that I really enjoyed about working with the kids. And so, yeah, I really like the creativeness around how AI is constructed uh, without all the, you know, the awful dark side. Um, and I also really, uh, I'm going to have a B part two, um, is the use of assistive technologies in education. That's probably something that I'm really excited. I've done quite a lot in that area as well. A lot of it's there within what we've got. It's free. And, you know, there's a say in which it's a nice to have for some and life changing for others. So assistive technology all the way, please. For sure. And then finally, who's your biggest inspiration in education? Mm. Um, well, so Tim uh, Bridgehouse was one of mine because I was very fortunate, as well as getting the award with you guys, humble brag, um, I also got a teaching award for a new teacher when I started teaching. And he basically came into the room with everyone that had won and he said, you're all here. And I won't swear, but he said, you're all here because you told everyone to do one basically and everyone I'd never heard another member of staff swear before <laughs> in education and I just thought it's true because I think the real rebels in education the real disruptors the real ones that are challenging and the real ones which will make the change are are telling people where they can go with certain things that aren't working and shouldn't work and should have been put in the bin a long time ago so um I've got lots of things that you can't see which essentially say the same thing around me but yeah, that would be my, that he's kind of my hero for saying that. And I think you've got to dare to be different sometimes in education. Love it. Love it. And to be fair, he, Sir Tim has had a few show types recently. So, so that's perfect. So Nick, Nick, thank you so, so much for joining us. Uh, we congratulations on winning 2024 uh, award for, from, 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 from us. And um, what you're doing is powerful. So keep doing that. And then hopefully, We'll we'll see you and many others at Uprising 2025. Tickets are in sale. You can get the link uh, in the show notes. Uh, thanks so much for joining us on the Edge of Futures podcast. Nick Ponsford. Thank you so much. Thank you.